in this session, we're going to uh, explore how the COVID-19 uh, epidemic has uh, hit our hospital and uh, also will draw parallels perhaps with the Italian experience, which is of course um, uh, very valuable and has guided us as to what we're going to be doing. Uh, we have Dr. Howard Marshall, who is the Chief of Service uh, of Cardiology uh, for our health economy, which has uh, uh, four, um, uh, three, uh, four hospitals. And uh, we'll try and go from the general to the very specific uh, points that may be affecting us uh, in the, uh, not just during the crisis, but also in the new normal. So Howard, please uh, tell us uh, how uh, the trip has been uh, up to now. Thank you, Paco. Nice to meet you, Mario. Um, so as Paco says, I've been, I'm service lead for cardiology at the University Hospital Trust in Birmingham, which um, Birmingham is, uh, is the UK's second city and the trust comprises four hospitals. Um, we've been pretty badly hit in Birmingham and the QE in particular, which is the, uh, the, the newest and biggest of the hospitals, has, has in fact the, taken the largest number of COVID patients in Europe, I think, and certainly had the largest number of ventilated patients with COVID in Europe. Um, at the peak of the uh, surge in Birmingham, we were transferring patients from our sister hospitals across town because they were very rapidly overwhelmed on their intensive care units. Uh, for example, one of the hospitals has 12 beds normally, uh, sorry, six beds normally and had 12 patients within the first uh, three or four days of the surge. Similarly, the other hospital had nine ventilators and had 18 patients within the first week. So very rapidly, we had to uh, divert patients from some of the hospitals to the QE. The, the initial drive was to upscale our ability to ventilate. We normally have about 80 ITU beds across uh, four areas in our hospital. And uh, we very rapidly said that we would upscale. We diverted anybody with previous ITU experience on the nursing front and on the medical front towards our ITU and uh, immediately put in a place that we would be able to double up patients in bed spaces. Mm -hmm. We then expanded to our old intensive care. We put our recovery area up for intensive care places. And we had a plan in place that we would have been able to ventilate probably 500 patients if we'd needed to. And goodness, we didn't get to those points. But at the peak, we had about 125, 130 ventilated patients in this hospital alone. Um, and even now, when we're past the, the, the current surge peak, um, there are about 300 COVID positive patients across our four hospitals. So it's been a really big impact for the hospitals in, it, in its own right. The response of uh, the hospital, guided by senior clinical medical staff, was to, to deal with this and to have the flexibility of getting staff where we needed them was to immediately put all our medical staff on a four days on, four days off, 12 hour shift rota, including overnights, so that we had that ability to deploy staff from ward areas to the acute medical unit, should it be required, to the emergency department, should it be required, and to the ITU and the principles I've already mentioned. Of course, that has a major impact on your normal ability to be able to deliver cardiology services. I know that the um, we won't be alone in saying that, of course, all our normal cardiology acute work seemed to disappear. <laughs> so our, non, our ST elevation infarcts stopped coming. Our patients yeah. with heart blocks stopped coming. Where were they? Absolutely. So we, we're, we're still waiting to work out what the aftermath of this in terms of non-COVID mortality and morbidity. And I know from our colleagues in Italy that We've demonstrated some pretty serious data to say that we're, we're missing a lot of covert mortality as, as associated with this. May I bring in Mauro? Mauro, is this your experience as well? Yes, uh, it was really dramatic to realize that in our, uh, in our city, we have two hospitals taking care of acute coronary syndromes. So our own unit stopped seeing uh, acute coronary syndromes just because we are the COVID hospital. Instead, the other ICU 
was ongoing as cardiology first line activity, but they had they had a decrease of over 40 to 50 percent. Same happened to AV block and acute aortic syndromes. We haven't seen an aortic dissection. We are the only center doing 24-hour on-call aortic syndromes, and we haven't seen one for three weeks. Our average is three a week, so there was something wrong. AV block fell down to 40% uh, of the normal period 2019. So where are these patients? Since uh, uh, 1st of May, our government declared softening the lockdown just because we are seeing lesser mortality and less hospital admissions. In 10 days, we have seen in my unit uh, 12 complete AV block, infra -ition. And normally we do eight in two weeks. So there are patients that have been uh, dying alone with cardiovascular disease, infarction being uh, seen as myocardial rupture or ventricular septal defect. And we are not counting them, but we are putting them in the count of the COVID just because it caused extra mortality from sure. something that happened with COVID, not because of COVID. Yeah. Howard, uh, how, how do you see uh, specifically in EP and devices? I mean, obviously the priorities have changed. We are having to choose our patients and the procedures that patients have. Which procedures are we going to prioritize and which devices are we going to prioritize? So if I, I'll deal with the EP first, I mean, there's been fairly clear guidance as to the, uh, the, the procedures that carry a prognostic benefit. And, and actually, do you know what, in EP, the, the prognostic benefit for most procedures is, is lacking. Um, however, we, we've prioritized patients, obviously, that, that present with pre-excited atrial fibrillation. And we've been prioritizing patients who um, have reduced LV function and are stuck in a rapidly conducted atrial flutter, for example. Um, I think the other thing to take note of is that actually there's a benefit in prioritizing some patients who are likely to access healthcare through the front door. So if they're frequent attenders with an SVT or they've got paroxysmal AF and they turn up at hospital every time they get their atrial fibrillation, doing something to stop them coming to hospital carries some benefit to the healthcare society, even if it's not uh, a prognostic benefit to that individual patient. So we've been triaging our EP list and, and, and we're prioritizing those sorts of patients. Um, we are beginning to uh, put a trickle of patients through, but um, we are very rapidly moving towards a model where we're gonna have to have hot and cold pathways through the hospital. So we're reconfiguring, we've just put up um, temporary barriers between two cath labs on one side of the block and two cath labs on the other side of the block that we can keep the patient separate and keep the pathways separate. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's going to apply to cardiology um, procedures across the board. With regard to devices, then clearly anybody who's got secondary prevention devices sitting on their waiting list are probably the first thing to prioritize. And then we have a difficult decision about primary prevention, ICDs and CRTs, which clearly do carry a prognostic benefit, but there is a definite negative to them being exposed to a COVID positive environment. And one of the things that we're seeing is when we're trying to bring some of these patients in, they're declining the offer of their procedure. They feel themselves that they're at high risk. And I've certainly got some uh, muscular dystrophy patients who right at the moment don't want to come anywhere near a hospital. And to be honest, I, I can't blame them. Um, I think with CRT, we, again, we probably need to prioritize the more severe heart failure, the class threes in particular, and, and, and do it on that basis, because again, you're trying to avoid them presenting to hospital. And again, that's probably where the biggest prognostic benefit is. Mm -hmm. So we have to triage in that way. But as I say, at the moment, it's quite difficult to persuade patients they really want to come to hospital. Howard, in a previous session uh, earlier today with Ian Wright, we were talking about uh, telemonitoring, which of course now has 
uh, resurfaced in a completely different environment. Previously, we've compared telemonitoring with usual care, which yeah. is face to face, but now we can't compare it. It's actually instead of. Yeah. So um, it's a completely different ball game. Um, how do you see this? I mean, are, are we going to? Uh, we are rolling it out already, but how, how do you see this um, overtaking what we've done before? So I think I think the first thing to say is that every cloud has a silver lining, and if there's a silver lining here, it's it's pushed us to to use the technology that's been out there and get it in place very quickly. And all the barriers that I've had. Um, with, within our trust, and I don't need to detail them, but there have been barriers at one point or another. Suddenly, they've been wiped away because our, our managers and our IT department now know that this is a way of avoiding footfall within the hospital. So that, that's one positive. But absolutely, we, we have to get used to the new normal, which is actually not seeing our patients face to face um, as much as we like. So we been a bit slow in this trust to to pick up on remote monitoring but that's now de rigueur for that's the standard for every device patient um, we've developed a, 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 a protocol for our first follow-ups where normally you would see the patient to do a wound check we've now got that done digitally so the patient with a smartphone can send us a photograph in a secure manner um, and i'm actually just come off another call which is looking at the wider use of digital technology um, and trying to link in with primary care so that we can get remote diagnostics done either at diagnostic hubs in primary care or even at, at non-care venues. We're looking at using Grand Central Station in Birmingham as our next diagnostic hub where there is space that patients can go, they can get an ECG, they can get their bloods done and we might even be able to uh, get um, digital stethoscopes installed so a cardiographer could apply a stethoscope to the patient's chest you can listen to their heart sounds which pretty much means you can do your consultation you can get your ecg you can listen to the patient's heart and you can work out what to do next without ever arriving in the same room mm -hmm. this is something i never thought i'd see in my career um, and to be honest i've probably been against that sort of approach but we are left with no alternative. If we're not able to see our patients face to face in the same room, um, we doing nothing isn't an option. So we have to use these wider technologies and and, and get used to uh, working outside of our normal parameters. There is one point that is really interesting because you uh, mentioned that um, at, at a certain point in a big city like Birmingham, you would try to um, um, retrieve diagnostics information from everywhere uh, just to prevent clustering of patients in the same place, just like a hospital. Yeah. But then uh, it is something we did, for instance, with COVID patients who were put on treatment with uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, they were taking other QT prolonging drug. We had to uh, combine safety and this approach. So we decided to have an ECG done at 72 hours. And the problem is how we do that, because uh, we had home ECG recorded in some patients, and that is fine. But you you need a lot of resources in the primary care setting. Yeah. Either we call the patient back, those who had no high fever, uh, to record an ECG at a dedicated COVID pavilion, and at that point you face the risk of meeting people who are through COVID and those who are suspected COVID and to expose your health staff. Uh, that, that could occur in the same way if you have an ECG recorded at the ground station in Birmingham. You can have clustering of people who are for sure carriers and some other who might become. How do you envision a way to, for instance, schedule appointments so every 15 minutes you have a patient coming in and rolling up? <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I don't pretend to have all the answers yet. Um, so, so, so clearly, um, uh, uh, testing has been uh, at the centre of pretty much every daily news bulletin in the UK because we've not quite hit our 100,000 target, 100,000 a day target that was set several weeks ago. Um, yeah. But testing becomes integral to this, doesn't it? So that we're able to 
keep our patient flows separate. I mean, I, I guess the point is that you, if we try to deliver echocardiography for everybody who needs it within a hospital setting, mm -hmm. we'll never manage social distancing. Um, <laughs> so the number of sites that you set up um, dilutes the number of patients who have to come to any one individual site. So we, we have to spread the work out. Um, sure, we're looking at pathways through the hospital. We're also looking at pathways through the outpatient department. Um, and those things we're still in the process of working out. But there's one thing for certain, it's not going to look the same as it did three months ago. I agree. I think that, uh, I mean, the transformation of healthcare is a necessity because if we don't transform and we don't move in directions that I, like you, Howard, have been reluctant to uh, undertake uh, before, um, largely because the, you know, the laws of medicine in a way that you have to take a history, do an examination, all of that is a, a little bit out the window now, yeah. uh, not because we want it, because it's necessary. I think it's been very useful uh, to, to have this insight uh, from you. Um, I, I think this will help us uh, see what we're going to do in the future. And uh, thank you very much indeed to, uh, to, to, uh, for your input, Howard. You're very welcome. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks, Howard. I really okay. appreciate it. Nice to meet you.